we'll be going to celebrate one of my favorite holidays, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is that day that we gather with loved ones, celebrate and give thanks for the many blessings from heaven. And of course, on that day, we eat, my favorite part. Fellowship family, this Thanksgiving will probably be very different for some of us. It has been a difficult year, right? So difficult that some of us this morning may be struggling with the reasons to be thankful. This COVID-19 pandemic has wreaked havoc on the lives of many. And yet it has affected everyone in some way. So fellowship family, this morning, I'm here to remind you that despite the devastation of this pandemic, we all have many reasons to be thankful to Almighty God because our being thankful should go much deeper than just be thankful for overcoming difficult circumstances. Our being thankful should be a never-changing condition, a condition reserved for Almighty God and Him alone. Because th through that thankfulness, we recognize and we are grateful for what he has done, for what he's doing, and for what he will continue to do. Fellowship family, we should be thankful all the time, you know, not just on Thanksgiving Day. We should be thankful whether we are in a pandemic or not, in good times and in challenging times. We need to be people that are full of gratitude and thanksgiving to Almighty God. Yet, if we are honest with ourselves, we sometimes struggle with being thankful. Because being thankful to Almighty God is not usually our nature. Our nature is to think of ourselves first. We are often concerned first with our needs, our wants, and our desires. And if those things are met, then we are inclined to be thankful. We shouldn't be this way, fellowship family, because thankful to Almighty God should be the first and foremost and a conscious act of expressing gratitude to God for all his blessings. And he has bestowed a lot on us, and he continued to bestow a lot of blessings on us. Fellowship family, our thanksgiving should be about him all about God. As believers, we should make a concerted effort each and every day to appreciate and give thanks for all the blessing God has given us. Psalm 92 verse 1 through 2 says, It's good to praise the Lord and make music to your name. O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. Day and night, those verses say we are to praise and thank Almighty God. The Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians 2 verse 6 that our lives are to be abound in thanksgiving. In Colossians 4 verse 2, he says we are to be devoted to giving thanks. In Philippians 4 verse 6, that says we are to do everything with prayer and with thanksgiving. And in Psalm 116 we read that we are to make our lives a thanksgiving offering before the Lord. And the book of Hebrews, it put it this way, we are to serve the Lord with thanksgiving. No mincing words. In our text this morning, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the Apostle Paul wrote, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. In the original Greek that this was written, this command was written in the present tense. You could translate it as continually giving thanks every day. And this is a great challenge, right? We would have no problem if the text says, give thanks when you feel like it, or give thanks when things are going well or give thanks to curry favor with God. It's that modifier in that verse that trip us up. It says we should give thanks 
in all circumstances. In, in this text, you see, please circle the word in. Because that's the most important word to keep us from misinterpreting this verse. It does not say give thanks for all circumstances. You have a flat tire? Thank God. I just had a car wreck? Praise the Lord. Seriously? You see, fellowship family, we do not have to give thanks for the evil in the world. And we do not have to, because the verse does not say for, it says in every circumstances. What Paul is saying is that no matter what happens to you in this life, be thankful. No matter what circumstances, no matter what struggle, no matter what trial, no matter what testing, be thankful. Give thanks. Fellowship family, let us make a new start this Thanksgiving by doing our very best to always be thankful in every circumstance. If you have a contemporary English version of the Bible, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Whatever happens, keep thanking God because of Christ Jesus. And, and I like that. Whatever happens, keep thanking God because of Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus. We know that we should give thanks when things are going well. Because it is right and good to praise God from whom our blessings flow. We shouldn't take our blessings for granted. Or think that we somehow deserve them. But fellowship family, if we only give thanks when we have money in the bank. When our marriage is good. When the deal goes through. When the doctor says the test came back negative. When our kids are doing well. When the church is growing. When our family or when our friends are glad to see us. If those are the only times we give thanks. Then what will we do when trouble comes? What will we do when our company downsizes in these COVID-19 times and we're out of a job? When our retirement fund loses 45% of its value? When our marriage collapses, when the cancer returns, or when our friends betray us? In those difficult times, fellowship family, we must still thank Almighty God for his love, for his grace, is mercy because those attributes of Almighty God does not change. But during those times, we have to trust God because try as we might, we cannot trace his hand in every circumstances because he paints on a canvas fellowship family that is much larger than our tiny scope. So how do we give thanks when our hearts are broken? How do we give thanks when we're confused? How do we give thanks when we don't feel like it? You know what we do? We recall Psalm 717 that says, I will give to the Lord the thanks due is righteousness, and I will sing praises to the name of the Lord Most High. I will give thanks to the Lord due to his righteousness. And I will sing praises to the name of the Lord Most High. Fellowship well, family, let me say this up front. Thanksgiving is not the essence and attitude of the non-Christian. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, he identified the Christian attitude to thanksgiving with some direct words. In verse 21 he wrote, For although they knew God, meaning the non-Christian, they neither glorified him as God, nor give thanks to him. Because they do not know God through a personal relationship with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, they seem incapable to thank Almighty God who created everything. They seem incapable to thank Almighty God who gives them life and breath. They seem incapable to thank Almighty God who gives every good and perfect gift. They come up with reasons upon reasons to be thankless. Some are thankless because everything is just a matter of luck and there's no one to thank. Others are thankless because whatever happens is just destiny and there's no one really to thank. And some are thankless because if anything goes good in their life, they're the ones to be thanked. 
because they pull it off. On the other hand, though, fellowship family, thanksgiving should be the essence of Christian living and Christian attitude. God's people should be thankful people, for we know how much we've been given. It's however interesting that even Christians can become thankless. Even Christians can violate 1 Corinthians 16.34 that says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for his good, for his steadfast love endureth forever. If you're such a person this morning, struggling with thankfulness to God, let me point you to the overarching principle that should be the basis of your thanksgiving. This principle is found in Romans 8, verse 28. And those verses says, And we know that all things work together for good, for them that love God, for them who are called according to his purpose. You see, fellowship family, if you place your trust in what Jesus accomplished on Calvary's cross, then the overarching umbrella that covers every situation you face or will face falls under the umbrella of Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. You see, in the chemistry of the cross, Almighty God, he takes the good, he takes the bad, and he mixes them together, much as a chemist might take chemicals in and of themselves, maybe poisonous, and mix them to make a medicine that brings healing. For example, many of us like salt with our food. Did you know that table salt is made up of both sodium and chloride? By itself, sodium is a deadly poison, and so is chloride. But you put them together, and you have table salt. You see, folks, a mighty God, he takes things that are bad, and he takes things that are good, and he puts them in the crucible of his power, his wisdom, his mercy, his grace, his love. And when he is done, the end result is extraordinarily good. We know that we have victory over sin. We know we have victory over Satan. But this verse in Romans teaches us that we also have victory over our circumstances. Whatever the circumstances that may come our way, we can rely on God's promise in Romans 8.28. Thank God that no one can take this verse out of the Bible. And may Satan never take it out of our heart. Because once it's stamped in our heart fellowship family, we will be able to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. Another principle that should be the basis of our thanksgiving, even though we may not feel like it, is found in Philippians 4, verses 11 through 13. In those verses, the Apostle Paul wrote, I'm not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hunger. Whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all of this through him who gives me strength. You see, in these verses, Paul said that he knew how to live when things are rosy and when things are not so rosy. How could, how could Paul live this way? How could he live above his circumstances, both good and bad? Fellowship family like Paul, whatever situation we find ourselves in, we should give thanks because we know that Almighty God is still Almighty God and he has our back. When our bills need pain, my bills need pain, but I'm broke. Almighty God is still Almighty God, and he has my back. So I can give him thanks. When all my bills are paid, and I have a little cash left over for a night on the town in Somerville, Almighty God is still Almighty God, and he has my back, so I can give him thanks. When I'm sick, or healthy, employed, or unemployed, Almighty God is still Almighty God, and he has my back, so I can give him thanks. Like Paul says, I've learned that I can rejoice and give thanks in everything. 
Because Almighty God is still Almighty God and he has my back in good times, bad times, happy times, sad times. In my best circumstances, I can rejoice and give thanks. In my worst circumstance, I can rejoice and give thanks. I can do this because Almighty God is still Almighty God and my security rests with him and he does not change. Even in times of trouble, Paul says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Even in the times of great anxiety, in times of great fear and worry and stress, we are to be characterized as being thankful people. Colossians 3 verse 17 says, Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks in everything. Colossians 2 verse 4 says, Devote your life to it. Devote your life to praying with an attitude of thanksgiving. Devote your life to it. For some of us, when we look at our lives and say, no, wait a minute, I wish that was true. I wish I could just go around thanking God for everything, no matter what it was. But I don't. I don't always do that. I don't always allow that spirit of thanksgiving to flow from my refurbished Christian art. And you got to ask yourself, why? There are so many things, Fellowship Family, that can prevent us as Christians from being thankful this morning. I will present you with six. I call them the six deadly enemies of thanksgiving. En enemy number one is doubt about the character of God. We are not sure that God's word can be trusted. When he says that all things will work together for good for them who loves him, and are called according to his purposes. When he says that his heart and desire for us is good for our good and not evil. When he says that he wills the benefit of his love upon us. Yeah, we're still not sure we can trust him. When he says that he's faithful and his mercies are new every morning. Yeah, he may not be telling the whole truth. Folks, if we doubt God's truthfulness, if we doubt God's character, we're going to have trouble being thankful to him. Because we're not going to be necess necessarily sure that he's really going to keep his promise to make all things work together for good. Maybe we doubt his sovereign power. Maybe we think, well, he means well, but he just can't pull it off. Although we trust his word and we know that he has good intentions, we doubt that he has the power or presence to see through. It's beyond him, this one. It's too complex, too difficult. He can't work this one out for me. So we doubt his sovereign power. Or maybe we doubt his wisdom. We say, I tell you what, he wants to keep his word. He's got the ability to keep his word. He just doesn't know everything. So when he works it all out, it isn't really for my good. If he would just consult me, I could, I could help him out because I got this all laid out. And if it works that way, my way, it will be perfect. So we question his doubt and we question his wisdom. And then some might even question whether he loved us. They may say, well, God would never let this happen if he really loved me. Certainly, he can't love me and be letting this happen to me. You see, fellowship family, any kind of doubt that attach themselves to the character, the word, the love, the wisdom, the power of Almighty God, they are going to take away from our desire to be thankful. Enemy number two is selfishness. This is the attitude that say, look, I don't want it the way it is. I want it the way I want it. I'm not content with the way how God is working out my life. I am not content with the circumstances which I find myself in presently. I'm not contented with the things that are going in my little world. 
I do not want it this way. It's not what I desire. That fellowship family is selfishness. And selfishness basically says, God, get off the throne and put me on it. I will be in charge. I will run my life. I will call the shots. My self-will is more important than God's will. My plan is more important than God's plan. Selfishness. I want my life this way. I want my job this way. I want my church this way. I want my spouse this way. I want my kids this way. I want my career this way. I want, I want, I want. And if God doesn't come in and fit the picture perfectly, then self-will begins to run roughshod over the plan of God and a thankless spirit is the result. Enemy number three is the love of the world. The love of the world. This covers someone whose vision is filled with the things of the world. Someone whose vision is filled with pleasure, prominence, popularity, prestige, people, places, positions. Someone whose vision is filled with all the trivia of the world, the stuff that is passing away. When we are so consumed with all the worldly stuff, and if our stuff doesn't work out the way we want it, we tend not to be thankful. This worldliness, it will prevent us from seeing the blessings of God because we are not looking for them. You know that great old hymn, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart? That's the heart of the Christian vision. Be Thou My Vision, Lord of My Heart. It's you I see. It's you I want. It's you I long for. And as long as Almighty God is our vision, we are going to see the blessings He has poured in our life and continue to pour. But if our vision is the material world, then we tend to miss all of that. And so we have no reason to be thankful because everything we are attached to Everything we attach our vision to and affection doesn't work out. And it causes us to be thankful, ungrateful. Enemy number four is impatience. Some people don't give thanks simply because they're discontent over the perception that God doesn't move on their schedule. God doesn't move on the tick of their clock. They just have no patience for Almighty God's timing. They want instant gratification. They can't say, thank you, Lord. I will wait on you. They say, God, like a child with a tantrum. God, I want it. I want it now. Not on your timing. I want it in my time, not yours. They want everything in their world fixed, and they want it fixed immediately. They cannot patiently wait. They cannot patiently thank God for what he has done, for what he's doing, and for what he will do. They want God to work for them to accomplish all their goals in their own time frame. Fellowship family, impatience will destroy thankfulness. We got to learn to thank God for his timing. If your thankfulness this morning is being hijacked by patience, be sure to keep Lamentations 3, verse 25 through 26 at your fingertip. It says, The Lord is good to those who hope in him, the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Enemy number five is spiritual coldness. You could call it apathy, lethargy. Usually the symptoms of this spiritual coldness is a lack of zeal for Christian service, a lack of love for Christ, a lot of diligence for studying the scripture, a, lot of, a lack of passion in worship, a neglect of the Bible, a neglect of prayer. If you're infected with spiritual coldness this morning, it eventually will leave you empty. You just become indifferent. Lethargic, spiritually, apathetic as the days go by. Folks, there's an apathy that exists among many Christians today. 
And it is the kind of lukewarm that steals thanksgiving. Lukewarm Christians tend not to look at things for which to be thankful. They have lost that intimacy with the Lord. They have lost the intense joy in the study of the word. And constantly their hearts have little or no gratitude or thankfulness. Watch for that one. It can creep up on you. Enemy number six is rebellion. Just plain old rebellion against Almighty God. I'm not thankful because I'm angry with God. I'm not thankful because I do not like what he's doing in my life. I am so mad that I will not be thankful. And I know I'm not thankful. And I'm going to stay unthankful. Just plain rebellious. In their minds, you're supposed to be here. But now they're here. And it's God's fault. There are Christians like that, you know. I've met a couple of them, actually. Where they are in life is not where they think they should be. And it's almighty God's fault. So they purposely withhold thanks. Because they're flat out mad. And that makes them unthankful. Folks, if we continue the allow any of these six enemies to control us, then we will end up hardly giving thanks in anything instead of giving thanks in everything. This Thanksgiving and beyond, if you find that you have very little to thank God for, let me, rem let me, let me remind you that you should always be thankful for your salvation and the unending blessings of God. You should be thankful for the unspeakable gift of Jesus Christ. You should be thankful for salvation, thankful for victory over sin and death. You should be thankful for divine guidance, for complete provision for all your needs. You should be thankful for the hope of glory. You should be thankful for the power of the word, the power of prayer, the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the abundant grace of God that is available to you. You should be thankful that Almighty God is sovereign, so nothing happens to us by chance. You should be thankful that Almighty God is always on the scene. We should be thankful that Almighty God causes all things to work together for good. You should be thankful that God is faithful, even when you're faithless. You should be thankful that God's grace is sufficient for you in every situation. You should be thankful that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You should be thankful that there's no dark place where the love of God cannot reach. You should be thankful that you're still God's child even when you don't act like it. So here are four takeaways for this morning. They have helped me over the years to develop an attitude of gratitude even when I don't feel like it. Takeaway one. Gratitude draws us closer to God. Fellowship family, God's command to be thankful is not the threatening demand of a tyrant. Rather, it is the invitation of a lifetime. The opportunity to draw near to him at any moment of the night or day. Do you sometimes long, fellowship family, for a greater sense of God nearness? Like, he's right here. I just need that extra sense. When pressure intensifies, and when nighttime worries grow into giant mountains, when the days are simply piling up one after another, and when life simply feels dull and routine, do you crave the assurance of the presence of Almighty God? Psalm 22 verse 3 says, God inhabits the praises of his people. That verse tells us that God lives in a place of praise and thanksgiving. So if we want to be where he is, we need to go to his address. We need to praise and thank him. This is the recurring theme in all of his psalms. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. 
Psalm 100 verse 4, let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Psalm 95 2, verse 2 says thanksgiving ushers us into the very presence of God. The tabernacle in the Old Testament was the place that God set apart to meet with his people. In front of the entrance to the Holy of Holies, where the secret, sacred seat of God manifests presence, stood the altar of incense where every morning and every evening the priests would offer up the sweet scents, representing the prayer and thanksgiving of God's people who sought to draw near to him. Those ancient rituals were types and symbols of a relationship that as New Testament believers, we can enjoy with God anytime, anyplace. Through his sacrifice on the cross, Christ had given us direct access to the Father. I double dare you this morning, Fellowship family, to see what happened in your life when you opened your heart afresh to the Lord and moved beyond the normal, the canned, the almost obli obligatory prayers of praise and worship. I double dare you to see what happens in your life when you truly begin to magnify him with thanksgiving, as Psalm 69 verse 30 says, when you express genuine gratitude to the Lord, he will be magnified in your eyes. And a magnified Lord will increase your depth perception of the God who knows your name, count the hair on your head, and manifest his love for you with one blessing after another. See if the practice of intentional gratitude doesn't transport you nearer to him. And not just where your faith can believe it, but your heart can sense it. The tiny hairs on the back of your neck can feel his presence. Fellowship family, as one writer says, thanksgiving put us in God's living room. It paves the way for his presence. Takeaway two, develop the daily discipline of giving thanks. In his sermon on Thanksgiving on November 1st, Pastor Bill challenged us to take out the calendar that is gathering dust on the mantelpiece. And for each day in November, write at least one thing you're thankful for. In his sermon on November 8th, he doubled down by challenging us not to only write what we're thankful for but to write why we're thankful. Uh, how, how is that coming, by the way? All right, okay, you forgot. I know, I know. The dog at the calendar. Okay. Well, you still have eight days to do it. And doing it is important because in order to be thankful people, we need to start giving thanks every day. Find something every day to thank the Lord for. And there's plenty. We need to discipline ourselves every day to be thankful. We need to fill up the spare moments of our lives with praise and thanksgiving. In Daniel chapter 6, we read that Daniel got down on his knees three times every day and he prayed and gave thanks to the Lord. That's the sort of grateful people we are to be. So I want to echo Pastor Bill's challenge to you to begin a regular routine of finding something every day to give God thanks for. No matter how small the blessing is, you learn to search it out. You learn to get the positive in the midst of the negative, and you give thanks for what you have. As the whole hymn says, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. I like this, this thing that Ellen Keller wrote in her diary. She says, she wrote, for three things I thank God every day of my life. Thanks that he has vouchsafed my knowledge of his works. Deep thanks that he has set my darkness the lamp of faith. Deep, deepest thanks that I have another life to look forward to. A life joyous with light and flowers and heavenly song. 
How about you, fellowship family? How about us? What can we thank God for every day? Takeaway three. No grumbling or complaining, please. No grumbling or complaining. Philippians 2, verse 14, instructs us to do everything without grumbling. The Bible is filled with warnings about complaining and grumbling. Because these are evidences of discontentment, and they imply that we don't think that God is doing right by us. It contradicts our faith. We cannot declare him sovereign and glorious on one hand, and then murmur against him on the other. This brings our faith, our salvation, and our relationship with God into ridicule. Folks, when we complain and when we grumble, we fail to give thanks to God. Instead of looking out for his goodness, his mercy, his blessing, we seem to delight in picking out what we perceive as his shortcomings. We are told that when the people grumble and complain, it displeases the Lord. Webster says to complain and grumble means to make a charge or an accusation. It is not merely disliking the things we have to bear, but it contains the element of finding fault with the agency that lies behind the thing. Folks, if we will carefully examine the true inwardness of our complaining and grumbling, I think we will generally find that they are found in a subtle fault finding with Almighty God. We secretly feel as if he is to be blamed somehow, and almost unconsciously to ourselves, we make mental charges against him. When the children of Israel found themselves wandering in the wilderness, they murmured against Moses and Aaron, and they complained that these two men had brought them into the wilderness to kill them off with hunger. But in reality, their complaining and grumbling was against God. For it was really God who brought them there, not Moses and Aaron. Moses and Aaron, they were like the second causes. The psalmist, in recounting the story afterwards, called this murmuring and grumbling against Moses and Aaron as speaking against God. We can therefore conclude that all complaining are speaking against God. All grumbling are speaking against God, whether we're conscious of them or not. We may think as the Israelites did, that our discomforts and our deprivation come from our circumstances only. And may therefore we feel at liberty to murmur against those second causes. Which we have to think that was brought about by our circumstances. But this morning, Fellowship family, let me remind you that Almighty God is the great cause beyond all second causes. The second causes are only instruments that he uses. And when we grumble and complain against these, we're really grumbling and complaining, not against our circumstances, but against Almighty God himself. You see, second causes, they're powerless to act, except by God's permission. And what he permits becomes really his arranging. The psalmist tells us that when the Lord heard the complaining of his people, he was wroth, meaning he was angry. And his anger came up against them because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. Fellowship family, at the bottom of all complaining and grumbling, this is what it means. We do not fully believe in God in that situation and we do not fully trust in his salvation. I didn't make it up. The Bible says so. Arthur Tracer Goya wrote, When we lift our eyes to God and remember all he's done for us, our troubled hearts can become grateful hearts. The more we do this, the more we hardwire our response, just as we hardwire grumbling and complaining, we can hardwire praise instead. Shifting our perspective can make every day a thanksgiving day. It depends on how you look at it. 
So fellowship family, every time you feel like grumbling or complaining, remember that you're not pleasing God. So go lift your eyes up to heaven and just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The final takeaway is this. Make a personal choice to be thankful. It is difficult to be thankful, fellowship family, at certain times. But we need to make that personal decision and that personal choice that we're going to be thankful people, even when we don't feel like it and it's hard. The Apostle Paul, he wrote these words from prison. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. When he wrote those words, he knew that the next footsteps in the corridor, maybe those of the guards who were coming to take him away to chop his head off. When he wrote those words, his only bed was the hard, cold, stone floor of the dank, cramped prison cell that he was in. Not an hour passed when he was free from the constant irritation of the chains and the pain of the iron mantle cutting into his wrists and his legs. Separated from his friends, unjustly accused, brutally treated. If ever a person had a right to complain and not give thanks, was this man. Languishing, almost forgotten in this harsh Roman prison. But instead of complaints, his lips rang with words of praise and thanksgiving. He was a man who had learned the true meaning of thanksgiving, even in the midst of great adversity. Earlier, when he was imprisoned in another prison in Rome, Paul wrote in Ephesians 5, 19 through 20, Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always give in thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think of it. Always give thanks for everything. No matter what circumstances, thanksgiving for the Apostle Paul was not a once a year celebration, but a daily reality that changed his life and made him a joyful person in every situation. Fellowship family, the giving of thanks to God for all his blessings should be one of the most distinctive marks of us fellowship people. We must make a personal choice not to allow a spirit of ingratitude to harden our heart and chill our relationship with Almighty God and chill our relationship with others. Nothing turns us into bitter, selfish, and dissatisfied people more quickly than an ungrateful heart that is not thankful to God. And nothing will do more to restore content and the joy of our salvation than a spirit of thankfulness. In closing, let me say this. The Apostle Paul, in our text, teaches us to be thankful in every situation, no matter what the circumstances are. When he said to give thanks in every situation, he's encouraged us to develop a lifestyle of thanksgiving. We are to thank God throughout the day for everything he's done for us, all the ways he's helped us, and everything he's promised us. Giving thanks to him, it shouldn't be something we only do once a day when we sit down to a meal or once a week at church or just before we go to sleep as we try to think of all the good things he has done for us that day. We often say pray your way through the day to help encourage people and encourage ourselves to develop a lifestyle of prayer. But it's just as important to thank our way throughout the day. The more thankful we become, the more aware we are of God's blessing in our lives, the closer we'll draw ourselves to Almighty God. And when we go through life with a growing awareness of his presence, thanking him often, every day, provide that additional blessing of drawing us closer to him. Let's bow for prayer. Father, grant us thankful and grateful hearts this morning so that we may always be appreciative and aware of the many blessings in our lives and not take them for granted. We ask for grateful hearts as we reflect on the past to see the ways you've been with us. Help us to become aware of how you have comforted and challenged us on our journeys. Encourage us to find the many, many aspects in our lives 
that call us to give thanks. Remind us often that we are indeed pilgrims on our way to you. We need not be afraid of the wilderness and the moments of feeling lost. For you have always there. You are always there as our loving guide and companion. Father, with the approach of this week's Thanksgiving holidays, our minds are turning to thoughts of thankfulness and gratitude. Thoughts that should characterize our thinking all the time. But that nevertheless are focused more clearly this time of year. Help us to feel this way all year. Since we indeed have much for which to be thankful. We are children of the heavenly king. The beloved of the loving living God. We are prepared for glory. And we are positioned for everlasting bliss in the eternal kingdom. Though trials and tribulations may come our way and needs, physical needs and emotional needs may come and go, we know that. But we also know that we lack nothing we need in your eternal realm because we are in Christ and in Christ are all the heavenly riches. We thank you for the time we spend together. And as we leave this place, we ask that you help us to take a fresh a spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving with us. And leave whatever spirit of discontent or grumbling we may brought, leave them right on the seats we're sitting. We ask these and other mercies in Jesus' name. Amen.